Bonjour tout le monde, euh, je vous retrouve aujourd'hui au Salon du Livre de Paris avec Marie Rutowski, j'espère bien dire le nom, euh, qui est l'auteur de The Curse que vous pouvez voir euh, derrière. Et donc nous allons aujourd'hui avoir une petite interview, on va parler de lecture et euh, d'autres petites choses. So my first question is, what inspire you to write The Curse Well, uh, I started with the phrase, the winner's curse, which okay. is a, a term from economic theory. And uh, my, my husband is an economist, and so sometimes I end up hearing um, different ideas from that field. And so the winner's curse it describes what happens when at an auction uh, you win the object up for bid, but the only reason that you have won it is because you have paid more than everybody else has decided the item is worth. And maybe in the future the item will be worth even more than you have paid, but in that moment, in the very moment when you win, Um, you win, but also you have lost at the same time because you have paid more than what everybody else was willing to pay. So you have paid too much. The phrase, the winner's curse in English is um, it's kind of mysterious and um, I felt compelling. So I thought it could be a good title for a book. And I set myself the challenge of trying to come up with a story that could match that title. And what I wanted most, as I was brainstorming what I could write, was to uh, show an auction where the winner would um, pay to a high price, not necessarily in terms of money, but in terms of emotions. That the winner would pay a high price with the heart. And so as I was thinking, well, what could this object be that would exact a great emotional price, it occurred to me that it was not an object that was up for a bid, but rather it was a person. And that was the, the beginning of the story. What kind of research did you do for the books about strategy or history? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I mean, colonialism is a huge element of the book, and of course I mean, this, this world has experienced yes. colonialism in many different and um, Uh, frankly horrific ways um, and so one example of research I did was to read uh, Edward Said's Orientalism. Though so actually it wasn't a book that I had read specifically for this project but rather a book that I had read several times and it maybe is because of that book that I was ready to write this particular story and then when I decided well this is the story I'm writing I returned to Orientalism to um, to see how Saeed describes uh, the dynamic between uh, an oppressive regime and the repressed people and, and how, in fact, um, part of the phenomenon of colonialism is that the colonizer begins to tell, they begin to tell themselves a story about what it means that they have taken a particular country and they have oppressed particular people. And in the same process of telling a story about themselves, but what it means that they are in charge, they are also telling a story about the people who have been oppressed. And of course it's a lie. You know, it was a lie. It is still a lie if anybody tries to tell that story. <laughs> but, it's, but it's interesting. I thought Saeed delineated very well um, how colonialism went hand in hand with myth-making. With cultural myth making. I wanted to talk about Kesren. That is something that I find very interesting in the book. It's the fact that she's strong, mm -hmm. but not in a physical way. She doesn't really know how to fight. Was it something that you wanted to write about her? Because today we really saw a strong heroine with a strong physical ability. So, was it? Um, J'ai mis mon nom à parti pris. Un délibérant choix. Oui, un délibérant choix. Ok, oui, oui, c'était. Vous êtes très astute. Vous avez vu ce que j'ai essayé de faire. Oui, je veux dire, j'aime les histoires où une jeune femme est très forte et est un combattant. Um, I love Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Me too. <laughs> I love um, I love Robin McKinley's books, like in the Outlaws of Sherwood, which is a retelling of 
um, The Legend of Robin Hood. Yes. Robin Hood is actually not very good at <laughs> archery. It's Maid Marian. She's the one who's really good. And I love that. I love that reversal of expectation. But I felt like there were already many characters like that in YA, yes. in, in, in YA fantasy. Um, and there were maybe fewer characters where um, a young woman was strong because of her mind. Where it was her intelligence that was the thing that allowed her to beat everybody else. Um, <laughs> yeah. and, and I just thought that it would be um, very satisfying to write a book like that. And I mean, there's only, the only other example, well, I love Megan Whelan Turner's books. Mm -hmm. um, she wrote The Thief mm -hmm. and The Queen of Atolia. Yes. She's such a good writer, and the characters are so well drawn. And I love Eugenides. And Eugenides is a little, you know, he and Kestrel share some things in common. Um, and he t he's very clever, and that is his strength. He's super, super smart. Um, but he's a boy. <laughs> and, and I think, you know, there's also room for, um, for young women to be represented in that way too. Did you know when you started writing the book that it was going to be a two point of view uh, book with Kesrin and Arun? I like this question very much. Um, <laughs> I I didn't really start writing the book with I, with any preconceived ideas. I guess I just assumed that I was writing from Kestrel's point of view. And then um, I came to a moment maybe a few chapters in, where I felt like I wanted to represent Aaron. But it was interesting to me as a writer that uh, at the same time I wanted to represent Aaron, I felt that he as a character would not want to be represented. That he, would, that he, does, he doesn't want anybody in his head, and he is only willing what he's willing to show to people is extremely limited. So every time um, I took his point of view, I wanted it to be brief, I wanted it to be limited, so that even to the reader, he wasn't going to, he wasn't going to tell the reader how he felt, right? Um, and that when we left his point of view, it would be like a door shut in your face. Um, and, and then, and so basically the first book is mostly Kestrel, with glimpses of Aaron. But um, after I wrote that book, I decided that what um, I wanted over the course of the trilogy was for his voice to expand, for us to see more and more from Aaron's point of view. And so I think that by the time we get to the third book, I don't want to spoil anything, but I don't think this is really a big spoiler. By the time we get to the third book, they, you get, it's pretty much equal. The book. I think that the book is as much Aaron's um, in the third book as it is Kestrel's. But that's not the case in the first two books. Um, if you could be one of your character, which one would it be? I don't want to be any of them. <laughs> any? No way! No way! Not even Kestrel! Oh my gosh, you suffer so much. <laughs> I don't... I, don't mm, I mean, Aaron is an amazing person, so it would be great to... Um, you know, have someone like him in, in my life, sure. But um, I, I don't know. I mean, many really unpleasant things have happened to them. Yeah. So maybe it'd be the tiger. But then his mother, oh wait, we haven't <laughs> even gotten to the tiger. The tiger's yes. in the second I, I know, but so <laughs> I don't know. So. Okay. All right, there's a tiger. Somewhere. A very cute tiger. <laughs> I, I feel I fear that I'm painting this book as an unpleasant book. No, it's but not. I have read the three books and I really really like them. And no, it's it's a great. Not too much suffering. Pleasurable really suffering. Yes. When it doesn't happen to you, when it's in a book. No, it's but okay. you got the the emotion, and I think when people read, it's what they want. They want to escape. Mm -hmm. So, of course, the curse is not the happy escape in a way, but you got so many feelings and emotions and I think it's great. I think um, a, a book is supposed to make 
people feel something. I and agree. It was really well, well done here. So, like we said, the French reader don't really know anything about the second book. Can you tell us a little without a lot of spoilers? Um, okay, well, I think, okay, so the first book you see a lot of uh, Heron, which is the colony um, that once belonged to Aaron's people and now, belonged, now belongs to Kestrel's people, um, and it's where Kestrel grew up. Um, and in the second book, you see the empire, right? You see that the capital city, um, you're in a different world, you're in the world of the court, and court intrigue, um, spies, uh, gossip, um, and that, that kind of, um, it, you know, it's, that part is, I think is very Game of Thrones, in the yes. sense that you, you're seeing people um, jockeying for power and also using the information that they have on other people to find out their own place and how they can get to where they want to be. So are you working on a new book or not? It's fine, personally. I, I, yes, I am working on a new book. Um, I've signed a contract with my American publisher okay. um, for a book that is uh, going to be set in this world, but um, a generation into the future. Okay. And I think in theory that's supposed to come out in fall 2018. But oh, I, I don't I don't know. Far away from I I guess it doesn't oh. feel so far away for me. Yes. <laughs> because I mean that's a year and a half, which yes. in publish in the publishing world is very short. It's very short. Uh, for the last part, I did something called in, in French portrait chinois. So the first one if is if you were a novel a character from the novel, which one would you be? Very short. Mm, Elizabeth Bennett. Oh, okay. From, one. from Time Precious. Mm. Okay. Uh, if you could live in any books universe, which one? There are so many to choose. Maybe in one of Lainey Taylor's books. Oh, I love her. I love her too. And um, I, I mean, I love her as a person and I love her. I love her books, and she is so good at world building. Yes, it's so layered. It's like a Mifoy, you know, where there are just many, many layers um, to the world that she's created. I don't know anybody who really does it like like yes. her. Um, so it would be kind of delicious to be in one of her worlds. Um, if you could meet any other dead or alive, which one would you choose? Well, I would choose Shakespeare, which is kind of an, an expected answer, I suppose. A lot of people would choose him. But um, in my other non-writing life, um, I'm an academic, I'm a professor, and okay. my training, my PhD, is, uh, is in uh, Shakespeare studies. Okay. So Shakespeare's uh, plays and sonnets have been important to me probably since I was 12 years old. Okay. And so I have many questions <laughs> about Shakespeare, and I would want to meet him. If you were a, a citation, a quad? Well, uh, I, don't, I don't, this is a very hard one for me. Okay. Maybe, maybe, I mean, Oscar Wilde is so quotable. Uh, maybe it's be yourself, everyone else is taken. Oh, it's a nice one. Mm -hmm. um, if you could be a book cover, which one? My book cover. Yes. Of course. And the last one is if you could be a movie adaptation, which is kind of tricky because mm. as a book lover, I know that sometimes it's a movie adaptation. So, so it has to have existed as a book before. Yes. I mean, when I was a kid, my answer would have been The Never Ending Story. Okay. I don't know if you've seen that. Yes. I had such a crush on Atreyu, okay. the little boy who, who rides the horse. He's kind of the warrior boy. <laughs> <laughs> and he gets to ride the left dragon. Um, I thought he was awesome. I used to tell people he was my boyfriend. Um, I mean, I was 10. Um, so I, I, think, I think even now, maybe I would choose something like Harry Potter. The world is so 
magical and it's so restful to watch the, the first movie. I was just thinking as I was watching the movie just how soothing it is yes. and how all you want to do is just sit in the grand hall of, of Hogwarts yes. or um, like look at the dragons breathing fire. Mm. But the movie adaptation is really great for mm. all of oh, the long the reading too. I oh, but who wants that, to be in that world? Yes. No. No one but wants to be. No one wants to be in the fires of Mordor. <laughs> what you do? No. You do? You want to be in the fires of Mordor? No, mm -hmm. but in that world, yeah. I mean, I did love the movie. Yeah. I love the movie adaptations. So this is all. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was very great and fun. And for me too. Thank you for your time. You're welcome.